On this podcast, we go one step beyond publications and guidelines to speak directly with leading experts in interventional pulmonology. This podcast will address not only fundamental topics and exciting publications, but also unconventional topics for which the evidence base isn't that robust. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the speaker and not necessarily endorsed by the AABIP. This is your host, Odit Chadda, an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And with that, let's dive into the next episode. As we approach the peak of the COVID epidemic curve and our ICUs get filled to capacity with mechanically ventilated patients who have required support for several days, we're now being challenged with the question of how to transition the care on some of these ICU survivors. Related to this, many patients, young and old, who have escaped multi-organ damage may benefit from tracheostomy tube placement. During the current crisis, this is uncharted territory into which we all are treading. Questions remain in everyone's mind as to when to trach and how to trach, amongst others. Societies like the American Association of Otolaryngology and ENT UK have come up with some recommendations to guide us. In addition, we extrapolate what we can uh, from other similar epidemics like the SARS-1. However, as we discussed during our prior podcast, this remains a moving target, and we are learning every day with growing experience. It's Monday, March 30th. And during this time, I could think of no better expert in our field to comment on and guide us regarding this topic than Dr. David Fellow Kopman. Dr. Fellow Kopman, a former president of AABIP, is a professor of medicine, anesthesiology, and otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. He is also the director of bronchology and interventional pulmonology there. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today, Dr. Fellow Kopman. It's my pleasure. Do you have any conflicts of interest to disclose that are relevant to today's topic of discussion? I don't. Perfect. So then let me start with a loaded question. Uh, So in critically ill patients, it still remains controversial, but many of us occasionally perform early tracheostomies, variably defined, but with the goal of hopefully liberating patients early from the ventilator and shortening ICU stay. Now, during the current COVID pandemic, should early tracheostomy even be considered? So it's a great question, but I think we really need to define our population as well as the reasons for considering early tracheostomy. So if we're talking about COVID positive patients, uh, I think the current recommendations from many institutions around the globe would be that you do not perform early tracheostomy. And the the reason for this is that uh, the hope is that the majority of COVID positive patients will actually end up getting extubated. Unfortunately, uh, some of them will pass away. So it's a minority of patients who are COVID positive with respiratory failure requiring mechanical ventilation that will need tracheostomy. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we really need to consider, you know, almost for the first time on, on a national and international level is the ethics and principles by which we make these decisions. Uh, Typically, all of our decisions are made with the patient's best interest um, as paramount. And though that's still of utmost importance, another factor that we really need to consider, um, and that has been discussed in um, venues such as the New England Journal over the past couple of weeks, is the uh, significant risk of transmitting the virus to healthcare practitioners. Mm -hmm. And if we start getting a significant number of healthcare practitioners uh, positive and out of commission, there aren't gonna be healthcare practitioners to care for the thousands and thousands of patients uh, who need their care. Mm -hmm. In, in, In terms of COVID positive patients, I would say the current recommendation is to wait uh, with the goals of getting these patients extubated. Um, And then the other part of the question is COVID negative patients or perhaps patients under investigation, what are called PUI. Mm -hmm. And that is where uh, there's a little bit of controversy. So you had mentioned the potential uh, benefits and harms of early tracheostomy. Um, And there have been several nice large randomized trials looking at this. 
Some older ones, uh, for example, uh, Rombach in critical care medicine um, did a, a nice randomized trial that showed actual improvement, not only in uh, mechanical ventilation days, ICU late to stay, but that study showed a mortality benefit. Uh, more recently, people might be remembering the Trachman trial, which showed no uh, benefit in mortality. Mm -hmm. And there are some clear problems with all studies that are performed. Um, so although early trach in general may not improve mortality, um, there is thinking that in select groups of populations, it certainly does decrease mechanical ventilator days, decrease IC length of stay, decrease the amount of sedation required, uh, certainly improve quality of life and the ability to communicate with uh, caregivers and family. And I would say that the best data is in two distinct populations. Uh, one are those with traumatic brain injury, uh, who you could predict very early on that, that they're going to require prolonged mechanical ventilation. And the other is a more general trauma uh, population, even without uh, traumatic brain injury, where studies have also shown um, that early trach provides significant benefit. So I think in those two distinct populations, there is clear data that early trait may be beneficial, mm -hmm. and especially in the current time where ICU resources are at such a premium, um, it may be best to do early trait in those patients with the goals of freeing up resources for sicker patients. Absolutely. Thank you. So let's say we have COVID positive patient who has a reasonable chance of meaningful long-term survival, and we do decide to proceed with tracheostomy, would you recommend a percutaneous or an open surgical approach and why? That's another really good question. Um, I think the first thing is you first have to wait and, and looking and talking with, uh, looking at guidelines and uh, talking with colleagues from around the world. I was just on a phone call um, at 7.30 this morning uh, with colleagues from uh, Britain, Australia, um, as well as the United States, the current recommendation in even terms of timing uh, of a COVID positive patient would be at least two, perhaps three weeks. And the re reason for that is uh, there are some data that suggests um, that viral shedding can last up until, you know, over 30, 35 days. And just because somebody has viral shedding and the ability to detect virus in tracheal aspirate via PCR doesn't necessarily mean that they're very infectious, but nonetheless, it, it's there. Um, and if we could avoid uh, aerosolized, gener um, aerosol generating procedures, such as tracheostomy and bronchoscopy, um, it would potentially significantly reduce exposure to uh, uh, the healthcare workforce. So then getting back to your question about um, technique, there are pros and cons of uh, either a percutaneous or an open method. And I think the current recommendation would be not to deviate from current practice. So if you're a uh, otolaryngologist and your current practice is open tracheostomy, uh, that's probably the way to go. Likewise, if you're an intensivist and you're uh, currently familiar with percutaneous tracheostomy, that mm -hmm. should be the method that you choose. There are a bunch of subtleties and techniques, both open and percutaneous, that might decrease the aerosolization of virus particles, and we, we could certainly get into that, um, as well as location as to where to do these procedures. Perfect, and where should we do these procedures? <laughs> so, you know, I, th I think most consensus guidelines at this time are recommending either type of tracheostomy procedure be performed in a negative pressure room, um, so if you're fortunate enough that your ICU has a negative pressure room, it is probably best to perform it at the bedside in an ICU negative pressure room. The second uh, best place to do so probably is still in the ICU uh, as long as you could get a HEPA filter um, to mm -hmm. filter out the, the small virus particles if possible, certainly with a closed door and ideally having an anteroom for donning and doffing personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to balance uh, that versus uh, doing the procedure in an ICU room 
that is positive pressure um, that may not have the ability to have a HEPA filter versus transporting the patient to a negative, uh, a negative pressure operating theater. Mm -hmm. um, the benefits clearly of doing this in a negative pressure operating theater are that the negative pressure room, the downsides are transporting a critically ill patient throughout the hospital, uh, having a potential for uh, ventilator disconnect and aerosolization of virus, um, and then also exposing an entire new team of healthcare workers, i.e. the OR staff, mm -hmm. instead of the patient's current staff at the bedside who has already been exposed. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And so, you know, patients with multi-organ injury from COVID will likely have a high viral burden and arguably should not be tricked. But there are many patients, especially younger patients, who may have cleared the virus and they just have disease residua like fibrotic ARDS, and they may benefit from tricks. Now, especially in the latter population that you mentioned, that patients who are in a non-negative pressure ICU room, do you see a role of checking a PCR pre-procedure? That's also, um, I think, pretty universal amongst everybody that I've spoken with. Um, in patients who are COVID negative or PUI, you know, most of these tracheostomies that we're talking about are elective procedures. Mm -hmm. So um, some centers are recommending um, one test um, that could either be a nasopharyngeal aspirate um, or perhaps even a deeper tracheal suction, as long as it's done in line, ideally without bronchoscopy. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly getting at least one, some sensors are recommending two negative uh, PCRs. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, part of that is dependent on the rapidity of the turnaround time for these tests. Perfect. Thank you so much. So from what we currently know, the SARS-CoV-2 virus can possibly remain aerosolized for up to three hours. And let alone performing a tracheostomy, even suctioning, disconnecting them from a ventilator could lead to dissemination of viral aerosols across the room. So I think it's beyond debate right now that while performing a tracheostomy, everybody in the room don full you know, personal protective equipment like we would for any other aerosol generating procedure. But could you highlight some technical aspects of the percutaneous approach wherein we could be even more cautious to minimize this aerosolization? Sure. Um, so I, I think either with the percutaneous or open approach, there's a nice consensus that we really should be doing everything that we can to minimize exposure. And, and part of that is having perhaps a dedicated uh, procedure team. Um, at Hopkins, we have a, a perk trait team. We're very fortunate that way with a dedicated group of anesthesiologists, as well as uh, surgeons and interventional pulmonologists. Um, but we sort of do a huddle beforehand, and, and that huddle includes uh, the primary intensivist, the anesthesiologist, as well as the surgeon and nursing and respiratory therapy. Um, and that's to make sure that we uh, are doing the right procedure in the right patient uh, with the right indications that we have all necessary equipment and you have a game time plan. Now, unfortunately for the trainees, Another recommendation is to have the most experienced person doing this. We want to really minimize uh, aerosolization and getting the procedure done as quickly as possible. So uh, I don't think these should be training cases. Um, these, these should be performed by someone who's going to be able to get the procedure done uh, most efficiently. So other things that you could do for the percutaneous approach um, is uh, when you're Repositioning the endotracheal tube, you know, one of the key differences between a percutaneous and a surgical approach is that the stone was created uh, caudal to the ET tube cuff on the percutaneous approach, such that as soon as we make a stoma, uh, you potentially can aerosol, aer aerosolize tracheal secretions. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas in a surgical approach, the stoma is usually made cranial to the ET tube cuff. Mm -hmm. um, but since we're talking about percutaneous techniques, uh, there needs to be really excellent communication between the uh, operator, the anesthesiologist, and the respiratory therapist, because when you're bringing back the ET tube cuff and deflating the cuff, ideally that should be done under apnea. Um, anytime you open up the airway, um, that should also be done ideally under apnea. So we need to pre-oxygenate these patients, um, have all our equipment uh, uh, readily available, 
when we're entering the uh, uh, trachea with the introducer needle, there should be a, a syringe attached to the needle instead of um, doing it. Some people I've seen do it without a syringe attached. Mm -hmm. um, after the guide wire is placed, gauze should be put around the stoma to make sure there's no aerosolization. Uh, likewise, uh, with the punch dilator, uh, the tapered dilator, and placement of the tracheostomy tube, ideally, it would all be done under apnea. Mm -hmm. So how can we potentially predict who that's going to be able to be done in? Well, you could do sort of a, a de-recruitment test beforehand, right? So one of the things that you could do is have a patient um, who might be, you know, oxygenating, ventilating okay, let's say on an FiO2 of 0.5 and a PEEP of 8, uh, you can increase the FiO2, drop the PEEP, ventilate them that, that way for a couple of minutes, and then have them go at it for a minute or two, and just to make sure that they're relatively safe. They don't um, you know, necessarily de-recruit or become hypoxemic. It'll just give you sort of that game time assessment of how they may do during the procedure. And then um, you clearly minimize people in the room, um, get the uh, cuff of the tracheostomy tube inflated uh, and connected to the ventilator as soon as possible, mm -hmm. um, and, and then secure the tracheostomy tube. Awesome. Awesome. This is all fantastic advice. Uh, but any specific advice on um, how we should modify post tracheostomy care in these patients? Another great question. Uh, and a lot of this we don't know. So some of this needs to uh, be coordinated with respiratory therapy as well as our uh, speech and language ther therapy colleagues. Um, whereas we're typically very aggressive in getting patients to talk and get the cuff deflated. Uh, in this patient population, we may not want to do that as aggressively. Uh, from colleagues' reports, the lung injury is often not associated with a lot of secretions. Some patients do have very thick secretions that require suctioning, but the majority of patients uh, actually do not have horrible amount of secretion. So you mm -hmm. could potentially change your algorithm to suctioning as needed instead mm -hmm. of uh, around the clock. You could potentially really try to have um, all patients have a, a closed circuit connections as opposed to um, having more patients on tracheostomy collar mm -hmm. uh, where they could aerosolize um, more virus. And one of the big questions, and this is going to be really dependent on local geographic um, and political forces, is what where we place these patients after their tracheostomy. Mm -hmm. When I was in Boston, uh, Massachusetts had a lot of long-term acute care facilities. So uh, the large, large, over 90% of patients uh, after I performed tracheostomy were out of the ICU uh, within 48 hours. Maryland, unfortunately, right now doesn't have a lot of LTACs. So uh, previously, patients would stay in the ICU you know, during the whole weaning process. As our ICU beds are filled now with patients with acute respiratory failure. Um, other areas of the hospital are being also staffed now for intensive care. Mm -hmm. The Baltimore Convention Center, for example, is being uh, prepped to turn into a hospital. Will the convention center be able to take relatively stable trade patients? We don't know that yet, mm -hmm. but I think we're gonna really need to work on triage and um, bed management which is a, a, something that's changing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very, very challenging times for us. This has been absolutely fantastic and highly enlightening. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for making time for us during these busy and challenging times. Uh, that's my pleasure. I think um, one of the key things is that <laughs> the recommendations that I have today may change tomorrow. You know, absolutely. We're, all, we're all learning from this uh, every day. So um, you know, I, I pray for... Everybody to stay safe and healthy um, and continue to provide outstanding care for our patients. Absolutely. Are there any points that we may not have addressed that you would like to discuss? Um, the one thing that we haven't talked about or, or um, as much perhaps is the multidisciplinary nature of uh, care of these patients, I think is essential. Uh, okay. It's really, really important. 
um, perhaps even to have your hospital ethicist involved in decisions mm -hmm. like this. Um, you know, the, the, it's a very emotional time for a patient, patients' families uh, because we're really limiting visitation. So how are we going to build that relationship with families that we normally are able to build face-to-face -face so, so much easier? So it, it's, it's a tough time, I think, for, not only for the patients and their families, but for the healthcare providers. Awesome. Thank you. And I have learned a lot in the short discussion, and I'm sure our listeners will appreciate every word of advice you've given them. Thank you so much, Dr. Fellow Kaufman. Take care and stay safe. You too. Thank you. With that, we conclude an exciting episode here on the AABIP podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed hosting it. Do also check out our website, theippodcast.com, and please do provide us with feedback and suggestions on what topic and which expert you want to hear next. Until next time, take care.